Yuridu Marang. This is another episode of Yinyamara, and we look forward to speaking with Tish King. It's really exciting because we're going to hear a lot of stories about the Torres Strait Islander peoples and also about connection and also a really important message about Indigenous youth. So let's get going. Welcome, Tish. Welcome to Yinjimara. <laughs> Thank you how so much for having me. How exciting. I've really been looking forward to this and we've had weights with COVID and we've had to uh, just really uh, hold on to that opportunity to talk with you. So it's really exciting and uh, it's just uh, so amazing that we can share a lot of different things today um, that are really going to inspire other Indigenous youth across the country, uh, Torres Strait Islander peoples and Aboriginal communities, nation peoples, sovereign peoples, as we know. So where did it all begin for you, Tish, as far as uh, your schooling and, and, you know, what, what experience was that? And to know that you actually went to Year 12, I actually went to Year uh, 10. So mm, not as uh, <laughs> great a greater outcome as you did, so what did that all mean, going to school and, and being a, a, a very much a cultural young person? Oh, no, thank you so much. And look, before I begin, I do want to acknowledge the country that I am on um, and pay my respects by um, speaking in my mother tongue. And so, Kulai kid nai lak esopoi ban, namun koi aga, nu murazapu ai mi thin. Alak nal punka poiban. Kapakut mitamuka muma murabai. Al mura mabiganu. Nuzu nal tish. Nai kakalag masugnu napa kakalag zanadek kesnu eso. And so I would like to acknowledge uh, the land that I am on and acknowledge that I am a proud Kakalug woman from the island of Masi Kakalgal Nation, the central island group of Zenith Kes, known commonly as the Torres Strait Islands, and really pay my respects to the cool and kinship where, we where I live and work and meet and pay my respects to the elders past and present and those who are emerging leaders in our communities across the nation and acknowledge the many contributions and footprints of those who have gone before us and honour their, um, their contributions to the culture, community and climate justice movement. And could I also welcome you on our country here at ANU, which is the Nullawell and Ngambri people. And I also, uh, you and Nadi, uh, Virginia Marshall, uh, Wiradjuri Ja, Wiradjuri Nyemba, Yina, um, Managul. So thank you so much for really being a part of such an incredible experience. And as we know, Welcome to Country is also not only a, a, a really important connection, but it also means that engagement and cultural safety that we have uh, to really um, signal to people who are not from country that you're welcome with your stay, uh, but also uh, there are those rules and, and those customs and, and traditions and practices that we know that um, we expect when, when we come on country. So thank you so much. Thank you for welcoming us and, and to acknowledge your country. A very proud, amazing woman. And, no, and and thank you so much for allowing me that space. And so, you know, to really um, like unpack, I guess, what you just said is that, you know, there are so many different pathways into how where our journey begins and how we um, got here. And so I, that's so interesting that you didn't finish, uh, that you went to grade 12 um, because, you are so incredible and so inspiring and I'm like yes you don't need uh you don't need to finish school to still make great waves and so no it's really great and so I grew up um really differently I while I was born on in the Torres Straits on Thursday Island on Y Benny and it we um you know spent my early years there but because of opportunities um for um I guess for anyone in remote areas, 
they were mostly in in regional towns or bigger cities. And so my mum sort of relocated and um, sort of, you know, we ended up on Olneth Country, which is in Cape York uh, in Queensland. Um, and so there is a um, beautiful country, um, that Western Cape in the Gulf of Carpentaria, uh, beautiful fishing, red dirt country, beautiful oasis and freshwater creeks, um, croc country. Very <laughs> much well. so. Jelly- <laughs> Um, and so I grew up in this really diverse and beautiful space but also in that um, beautiful country was really rich in resources and so um, they mined bauxite and uh, in those early days when I moved there kaolin and so I really was um, really saw firsthand um, this really interesting dynamic of um, like white Australia mining industry, the working class, but this melting pot of like 11 traditional owner groups in this one uh, beautiful space, caring for country, adapting to its changes and still continuing to teach um, culture and their culture. And so through my um, really uh, young years there, had the privilege of learning from an incredible um, creative and elder, well-respected elder, Than Koopy. Um, who was an incredible artist who had these like summer programs and it's something that was like, you know, I, you know, felt really dear to my heart that because despite being, you know, disconnected and and away from my island sea country, my mum always, uh, you know, um, immersed us into appreciating the culture, the the country that we were on there. And can I just ask you that it's really important what you've said about being connected to Cape York, but you only saw your first white person when you went to boarding school. Tell us more about that. Yeah, it was it was actually more my first white Aboriginal person mm-hmm. um, that I'd actually seen when I went to boarding school, you know, for further education. Um, I sort of went in uh, really naive and actually didn't realise uh, that there were young Aboriginal people uh, there but actually were fair skin. and it was in that moment did I actually truly, well, even then did I not really understand but did I see that, oh, you know, you're from, you're, you're Aboriginal, but I've never, I've never, I've never seen a white Aboriginal person. And I went to this incredible, you know, and she, um, this incredible woman was from Sherberg, um community and Mergen and, you know, her connections were there. And I just, you know, to me, it was really confronting. Um, and where even through that same, you know, week that one of the nuns handed me Aboriginal beads, um, which there was nothing wrong with that, but I'd been so strong in identifying as Torres Strait Islander, didn't realise that my complexion probably was quite native Hmm. to some. Hmm. Um, And so it actually really triggered um, an identity crisis um, because I sort of was navigating sort of this... Um, you know, trying to hold, stay strong of culture and but navigating in another for, you know, education and trying to mm. learn but being, mm. <laughs> not knowing <laughs> the systemic racism that was, you know, uh, limiting people to be connected to me or me to connect to people. And you've and had so- that experience, haven't you, you know, with racism and and really finding out, as you can, as you've just said, then a lot of Aboriginal youth uh, really feel that uh, they're not connected because people treat them differently and don't see them in, in the way that we should. Which is, you know, whether you're dark skinned or light skinned, you're an Aboriginal person, you're a Torres Strait Islander person. So, so how did how does that play out? when you actually then uh, think about uh, the days that you uh, were fishing and and having, you know, a really wonderful time on country and feeling loved and cared for in a very positive space. But then when you've got to go on the mainland, which you spent a lot of time, and I think in 2020 you went back home 
uh, which was a really important and exciting thing. But how does it feel when you've actually got to be on the mainland and not be on country? What, what does that feel like to you? Wow, we could go on for like, wow, yeah. that's a big, that's a really big question. Um, and so, you know, really, I guess really hearing that is like hearing that it's been that long because it had been 20 years since I had been able to reconnect to my traditional island country. And, you know, it's been hard, you know, having it you know, feeling so deeply connected, knowing that you belong somewhere, but wherever you went, you didn't belong anywhere, mm-hmm. was just kind of like, hang on, but I have all these feelings. I have this deep connection and what does it all mean? And so it was actually like just, you know, really powerful because, um, you know, I'd really been chasing that feeling and adapting. And so that was like through, you know, through my travel and experiences that, you know, connecting to culture where I could, whether that would be mine or, you know, um, a beautiful, um, you know, one across the world. Um, It was always appreciating like their way of life and their way of living. But coming back to our back door and our backyard and seeing our diverse and ecological sea country and then really see how under threat it is from that real systemic, like, uh, you know, change was just like, okay, something's got to give here. Um, and so, you know, it's, then it really felt, it really was ingraining when seeing that, um, you know, like you can call it like environmental racism, but when going back to Musig and seeing that my family were using, you know, adapting to their resources and using pallets that, that goes on forklifts as a seawall and putting palm leaves and coconut husks to stop the waves and to just diminish as much erosion as they can was really where, like, um, okay. That's right. And, and, and that's right. And the most important thing when we look back at communities, we have to go back historically, right, which is to Weeper and where where communities have been moved. And your experience is really interesting because you said when you were looking into the river and you were fishing, that you understood pollution and food security go hand in hand in understanding uh, bauxite and, and other uh, tailings and um, uh, really exploitation of those rivers. It really had a, a very deep and an abrupt feeling for you that you could understand uh, really that, you know, these rivers weren't being cared for and and they were just so polluted. Um, how does that then really make you feel about when we talk about mining today and those issues of economy over caring for country? Absolutely. Like really great segue into then those experiences there was that you're absolutely right through the runoff of like, you know, the mining industry saw how, you know, those downward impacts were impacting communities, you know, in that area where, you know, you'd go out fishing and we just weren't catching as many fish and it was like, okay, maybe it's a bad season, but really it's actually the runoff and pollution from these corporations. And so when going back there and actually um, working in the resource sector, it was actually, it was really confronting because, you know, I actually did think that, you know, corporations did, um, you know, were progressive and were doing the right thing um, and seeing how much employment that they had created in community. But what I actually saw was, unfortunately, that they, it's a business, it's a business still, and it's a numbers game. And actually, they, they do the bare minimum to support not only traditional owners, but to the, you know, to communities that have been displaced there, but, you know, raised on that country and been looking after and adapting, you know, um, and thriving in those, in that country. And so it was just like, okay, wow, 
you know, for, for too long have we seen, you know, uh, at, at, like these the nepotisms and connections between governments and corporations to continue to allow these type of like, you know, shortcuts. And I think as a young person, you know, through my experiences, I've, I've actually been raised under a coalition government. And so it's been really defeating, um, you know, knowing that can there be real change? Like, can we really like, uh, can we really fix this? Is it maybe maybe this is you know my fault? Maybe I need to do more. But realizing that because of those like you know injustices that we actually have you know that First Nations people haven't had the autonomy and rights to say you know what and what doesn't happen to their land and seas. And so That's you know right. I really exactly. I realize like it's a deep reflection from the fight for land rights that extends you know from the arrival of the tall ships in 1780. So could I just ask you too, which is really an interesting question, you've had a, a, an international uh, group called the Torres Strait Eight and they went overseas and, and unfortunately it wasn't successful in terms of outcomes in international law uh, in being supporting uh, the arguments put by the Torres Strait Eight. But they really came back with really positive attitudes. What were they? You know, that, you know, d despite this, we, you know, we are still going to continue to amplify the stories mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the incredible strength and resilience of like Torres Strait Island communities. You know, we are still taking our voices to these platforms to make sure that, you know, people know, um, firstly, you know, the climate impacts and that, you know, how island people are disproportionately affected when we do not even contribute to our nation's emissions, to our global emissions. And so it was something that was just really empowering and that, you know, I feel honoured to be able to continue to help support and amplify those leaders that are spearheading this incredible campaign. So do you think that um, when you, you went to COP26 in, in Scotland, that there was a, a place that you could actually be that uh, really as a collective of youth and young people, you felt a lot of energy after that outcome with the Torres Strait 8. Did that revive you and, and really energise you and more likely than say, well, I'm not going to stop here. I'm going to look for COP28 and nothing will stop me. Was that the sort of response? Absolutely, because you're right, Annie. Like, oh my gosh, you were there. You saw my tears. <laughs> it was it was a journey for all of us. Um, but no, you, that's exactly right. Through it all, I found so, you know this incredible like strength, this community of strength and just solitude, but just of like solidarity at the Indigenous Peoples Pavilion, uh, which just actually was this ridiculous that it was a small space, but despite it all, and this is just what I think, you know, a reflection to Indigenous people right around the world, hey, is that, you know, together we may be from different, we may have different cultures, but together we do stand united together as one voice. And it was really incredible to see that those that have been advocating, you know, uh, and the knowledge holders in um, other, across other um, Indigenous nations, across the globe they bought they they bought young people a young person representative who was just so strong in culture and leading in their space that actually for the first time created uh, a safe haven to be able to share because this is a legacy you know, of colonization, the patriarchy and racism that got us in this, you know, that got us here to the climate crisis is that this is the legacy left to us. And this is the legacy that we, you know, will, are inheriting and are, you know, taking on as our responsibilities in community, but for culture and for our people. Hmm. And so to know, to know that the next generation being there and having that, you know, standing shoulder to shoulder was really incredible. And that's what gives me the mana, that love, that deep connection, knowing that I have hope 
we have hope and you know now especially for um you know as we have seen um you know this transition of government that it you know there are more things that we could be hopeful for to just shift but continue to ramp the pressure for change yeah well i think one thing that you did mention uh when when you uh were talking about climate change and you know really thinking about country but when you walked on country uh in at at home you remember that story about uh walking and finding the bones on the ground of your ancestors and this is also to do with rising sea levels now for an aboriginal or 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 a torres strait islander person of country how was that experience when that to me would be one of the 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 most difficult experiences that i could even imagine you know what i uh i still think about you know i wake up thinking about that experience and you know what that means in a reflection to how i live you know live my day with integrity and cultural integrity but it was really confronting you know to know that that our sites are continuing to be desecrated from rising seas you know that has been exacerbated by you know fossil fuel expansion is just like heart wrenching um and really fighting back to use now um because you know i um it's it's respecting our our, our matriarch you know to to you know when i had to pick up you know i picked up you know a part of the skull and it was just like you know my these bones are undressed and we talk about, you know, conservatism in our communities and, you know, it's the same thing. It was just a, such a sign of disrespect to have, you know, my great Akas, you know, laying like that, scattered like that, you know, on land that has been hers her whole life for, you know, generations and generations before colonisation was here. And so, you know, it was then it really struck that, you know, as a young person, I have to, um, I have to use my my education and privilege, um, and experiences to continue to amplify, um, you know, our our culture and communities, um, because to me, they're the real heroes, being able to thrive and still continue to be be on country. And that's really um, what climate change is. It really is a personal experience. And it's a heart wrenching experience, and and I guess when the science is only um, responded to and listened to, we really miss those opportunities of hearing those sort of stories from you and from many others, from our peoples across this land. So it it really strengthens you, and I know that you've um, had great opportunities with CSIRO, and you've been a part of Seed Organisation for Youth. But now, uh, how do you think Groundswell is going to be an organisation that can grow with you, but you can achieve some of those um, really loved um, uh, parts of who you are and and that expression of your identity? Yeah, no, I think it's um yeah a really great segue into exactly what um this you know exciting new journey that I'm on because. You know, we know First Nations people, you know, um, are leading in their community. They and community and, you know, those leaders and traditional knowledge and elders, they know they have the solutions. They know the solutions for what's good and healthy for country. And so, you know, as I sort of um, move and um, share my knowledge with the incredible grounds are giving, you know, with their mission to accelerate and amplify climate action in Australia by creating um, a community with new givers to fund those strategic, you know, impact projects, then it's about, you know, just connecting up the change maker to the resource because, you know, we are in this critical decade and with science and traditional knowledge and our country uh, being under, you know, 
hurting and mother nature letting us know how much is hurting we really need to turbocharge these community-led solutions out there and we i look forward to really working together and connecting and um learning from those communities that are you know in sharing their knowledge um, and using, you know, the knowledge that has been passed down for generations and generation that goes into caring for their land and sea country and for their beautiful rivers and waterways. And so I'm excited for the next, you know, next six months, um, how we can get together, stay connected and make it, uh, make this change. Yeah, that is very exciting. And I think that one of the messages that you would probably have thought about many, many times would be what are the three things that governments need to do to connect and really assist youth in in really forging forward? Yeah, look, I mean, firstly, I mean, let's have a seat at the table, right? Good start. <laughs> for two long, yeah, for too long, like, you know, young First Nations people have had, a, you know, had a seat missing at the table that impacts, you know, when decisions are being made that impacts their future. And as shared, you know, we are inheriting these responsibilities. And so we need to be there because we know and are doing the work and incredible organizations like Seed Mob and Pacific Climate Warriors that are out there on the ground, you know, uh, uh, continuing to do what's good for country, culture and climate. Um, you know, secondly, um, I guess, you know, uh, connect up to you know the any change makers that are you know doing the you know good work out there um and you know um like take part of their actions and support you know the work that they're doing uh, but also you know mostly like it starts with community consultation you know importantly um, and we know how important that is when we've seen organisations that you've been a part of that have done that work. Um, we need to really come back to, you know, these commitments now that governments have made um, and actually to hold them accountable towards it and see now and their progression to as we shift um, into um, into these, like, you know, these solutions. But importantly, when we have these consultations with First Nations people, we need to be have them leading in this space. And um, also just quite like, not quietly, but, you know, <laughs> at the end of the year, like last year, the cultural heritage, you know, final reports, um, you know, of this, of, sorry, the Duke and Gorge um, final report came out that had incredible recommendations um, that, you know, if actually embedded into legislation could give, you know, First Nations people, you know, the autonomy um, to, you know, veto rights and, you know, go back to, you know, having that say of what happens or what doesn't happen to country. And so it goes back to that. Um, and so, you know, they're incredible work now doing the um, doing that. And so we need to just get those, you know, leaders um, into community because that's where it is. Yeah, well, it's that sounds very office. exciting. And I think you're <laughs> going to be pretty busy, um, as we all are, um, just waiting for those opportunities at COP28 and, and really trying to use, as you've said all along, is trying to network, uh, trying to let people understand um, how when country hurts that we hurt personally. And, mm -hmm. and it's not just really laws and policies, is it? It's more than that. It's, it's our being, uh, the water's our identity, um, the deserts. Uh, you know, every part of this country can't be separated. Water can't be separated from land. And, and this is our journey where we, we're part really of, of everything that we see around us. So it, it means that we really can't just go to bed and clock off, does it? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not for mob. <laughs> <laughs> not for long, that's right. That's exactly right. But it, look, it's been an amazing journey and I, and I think that um, all of your family would be so proud of you and, and I hope when um, uh, many other 
uh, young people really listen to your words and, and especially uh, words of wisdom that it will really um, encourage young people not to lose hope that, you know, even though, as you've said, you know, the circumstances mightn't be great, you've been through that yourself uh, and, you know, many others and myself included. So nothing has always been easy, but, you know, again, putting that message out of hope. And I, I think that that's going to probably just uh, really keep us strong uh, until, you know, we have to be resilient, right? So, yeah, I think that's fantastic. And I've really loved talking with you and listening to your your um, incredibly encouraging words. So, so Tish um, Managuru, thank you so much, and uh, power on. We look forward to seeing so much uh, in the future for you. Esso, Auntie, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Yawo, kapokut, good afternoon. Managuru.